I quit house hacking. And that's not clickbait, that's true. We moved out of our duplex and we sold it. Escrow closed last week. Here's the final settlement statement. So what happened? What went wrong with my house hack? And more importantly, what's the fallout for me and for my family? If you're considering house hacking, I'm about to tell you the stuff you need to hear before going through with it. Maybe house hacking is for you after all, but I'm making this video sharing this cautionary tale as a gut check for anybody who's about to make the dive. I also just quit caffeine. I'm like four days in, and this is literally the first video I've made without a cup of coffee next to me. So just let me know in the comments if I'm off or something. I house hacked a duplex with my wife and then one-year-old daughter in 2019. But my story is a little unique in that our house hack wasn't our first home purchase. It was actually our third. Here's me in 2009 signing closing docs on my first home, this 800 square foot bungalow off Sunset Boulevard on Los Angeles' east side. We traded up to a larger home nearby in 2014. Here we are moving in. And here we are moving out in 2019 to house hack a duplex. I'm a spreadsheet junkie. And running the numbers, buying a duplex in order to live in one unit and rent the other made so much sense. I eventually made a spreadsheet to share with other house hackers, and I've spent this summer creating a free web app for analyzing house hack deals based on my spreadsheet. I call it the duplex calculator, but you can use it to analyze any house hack, from a single family home with rented bedrooms to a duplex, triplex, or a fourplex. Run the numbers for yourself easily and clearly and for free at www.duplexcalculator.com. And even though we weren't typical house hackers, our duplex was our third home, our motivation was exactly like any other house hackers. We wanted to use real estate to enrich our lives, to enhance our lives, not ruin our lives. Because the traditional paradigm is to work and save and work and save until you can finally put all of your life savings and half of your income into a house. And congrats, you've achieved the Pyrrhic victory of being house broke. But by house hacking, by capitalizing on real estate's ability to generate income, you're able to flip the script and get way more back from your home than you ever put into it. In our case, we wanted to live in a nice neighborhood near good schools. And in Los Angeles, that's a laughably expensive endeavor. Technically, we could have afforded a small home in a good neighborhood, but it would have sapped us of our savings and saddled us with an absurd mortgage. I mean, I would basically have had to put all vacations on hold until retirement to support that payment every month. But one feature of LA that I love is that most of it, most of the main city down in the Santa Monica Basin, was built about 100 years ago, give or take a decade. And back then, zoning was much looser than it is today. So throughout Los Angeles, in otherwise single-family neighborhoods, you'll find a random block of small multifamily properties. So that's what we started looking for. And in mid-2019, we found it. A 1923 duplex in Windsor Square, a 100-year-old LA neighborhood that's home to the mayor's mansion amongst dozens of other historical estates. Our duplex cost about the same as a small single-family home just outside side Windsor Square. And for that price, we got two homes, a three bedroom, two bathroom upstairs unit and a three bedroom, two bathroom downstairs unit. Our new property needed work. So we had a contractor on site during our inspections and started renovating the day after closing escrow. Downstairs was mostly cosmetic work, painting all the walls, buffing all the hardwood floors and taking the kitchen from this to this. We also redid the bathrooms in keeping with the generally 1920 style. Upstairs, we had more cosmetic work to do, and we decided to add a bathroom. Previously, this terrible, albeit large bathroom, sat next to a closet in a hallway between two bedrooms. We blew out the bedroom wall, the bathroom, and the closet, then constructed two bathrooms where the old bathroom and old closet had been. The result, two end-suite bathrooms where there had previously been a shared hallway bathroom. Home reno tip number one, end suite bathrooms are very much in demand these days. Home reno tip number two, if you do add a bathroom to a home, it's most cost effective to do so where there's already plumbing. By adding a bathroom right next to an existing bathroom, we saved ourselves the expense of running new plumbing across the unit. Old laundry rooms make for great bathroom conversions. All right, back to the story. We also added HVAC to each unit and installed a new roof, which the sellers paid for by way of closing credits, and presto, the renovation took four months, went $11,000 over budget, and we finished just in time for our first tenants to move in at the end of 2019. Our first tenants were awesome. 
They stayed for two years and our second tenants were also awesome. We refinanced during the pandemic to get our monthly cost of living absurdly low for Windsor Square and I became block captain which is an actual position, volunteer position, for the Los Angeles City Council. So what happened? Why did we quit? Well, there's really two questions to answer there. One, why did we move out? And two, why did we sell? And three, why haven't you clicked the like and subscribe buttons yet? Liking this video helps it reach more people who are considering house hacking, and you should subscribe for more helpful house hacking videos to help you on your journey. All right, back to the story. Why did we move out of our duplex? I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. House hacking requires some compromises. To take a step back, unless you're fabulously wealthy, any home ownership requires some compromises. You can choose a big house, the perfect neighborhood, a short commute, or a toilet for each member of your family, but you're not gonna get it all. Again, unless you're fabulously wealthy. You'll have to compromise somewhere. House hacking requires a different kind of compromise. Our Windsor Square home was large, had a pooper for each family member, short commute, great schools, but, we had downstairs neighbors. And our neighbors weren't the problem. We'd sometimes hear them, they'd sometimes hear us, but my wife and I were okay with that compromise. We both lived in New York before moving to LA, so occasionally hearing somebody laughing through the floor wasn't a deal breaker. What sort of became a deal breaker though was when our daughter, around the age of four, started stomping her feet or jumping up and down to express her frustration with whatever silly thing was going on brushing her teeth or TV time ending, whatever it was. It was important to my wife and I that we teach our daughter that she should express herself. And with young kids, that usually means settling for forms of expression like stomping and jumping. Long story short, I didn't wanna tell my daughter to stop being loud, to stop expressing herself on account of our tenants. Some parents would have no problem doing so, but what can I say? I'm an atheist, I'm left of center politically, but when it comes to parenting, I'm pretty fucking hippy dippy. So there's that. Plus, we weren't actually thrilled with our daughter's school. Plus, some of the residents of Windsor Square are pretty stuck up. So we started looking around for another spot in LA. Now, before we move on to the question of why we sold, let's make a learning moment out of this. What I don't want you to take from this anecdote is the moral that you shouldn't house hack. That's the wrong lesson. The correct lesson is when you're looking at properties to house hack, be realistic about the compromises you'll face and how they'll impact you. And the good news right off the jump is that you're choosing the property. My wife and I chose a century old upstairs downstairs duplex, which is just about the worst layout possible for sound transmission between units. You'll fare much better with side-by-side -side units or units separated by a garage or even separate structures on a lot. And even in the case of attached units, you can execute simple upgrades to deaden the sound transmission. Least expensive to deal with are side-by-side -side units, where you can use this stuff called green glue to add an additional layer of drywall to the wall that connects the units, just that wall. A drywall contractor can do this in a day, and you can paint the new drywall yourself. With upstairs-downstairs units, you can deaden the sound transmission by putting a soundproof underlayment, like one of these, under the floor upstairs. This costs more because you'll have to treat more square footage and flooring is more expensive than drywall. Why didn't we do this? Well, like I said, we were in a 100 year old building and our floor was the original 100 year old oak planks. There was no way that the floor of that apartment, so long as we owned the building, would be anything except those 100 year old planks. And soundproofing the floor while keeping those planks was prohibitively expensive. So we moved out, but why did we sell? Well, we certainly didn't need to. The property would have cash flowed well with tenants in both units. And we didn't want to, at least that wasn't our plan. But here's the thing. Whenever you buy real estate, you need to have more than one exit strategy because, well, life happens. And that's what happened to me. I'm a real estate agent, a real estate investor, and a house hacker, well, was. But the biggest source of my family's income is a film production business that I operate. That's why we're located in LA. And my film production business was severely impacted by the lockdown in 2020 and 2021. All in all, I basically shut down the business, my largest source of income, for a full year. And again, right now, my film production business is severely impacted by the writer's strike that you may have heard about. Hollywood screenwriters are striking for better working arrangements and protections against AI, and I support the screenwriters. But this strike has led to a production slowdown, and once again, my largest source of income has dried up. And sometimes, that's life. So plan A was to live in our duplex for four to seven years, and with our reduced cost of living, save for the next down payment on our forever home. However, thanks to a once in a century pandemic, followed closely by a once in a decade or two industry strike, I haven't been able to save enough. Simply put, we don't have enough capital to hold the duplex 
and purchase our forever home. So we executed plan B. Give the building a fresh coat of paint and sell it to another owner occupant. We renovated the upstairs with owner occupants, first us, then whomever might follow in mind. So we were confident that whenever we sold, we'd do pretty well. And selling the property myself, I made sure to market it as an alternative to the single family homes nearby. We definitely benefited from the absolute dearth of supply on the market. Here's the thing though, what I just told you about having more than one exit plan for a property whenever you buy one, that's canon. That's a fundamental rule of real estate investing that I must have learned years ago. But having to settle for plan B because plan A failed, even though you went in knowing either outcome would be positive, well, it still feels pretty shitty. So where does that leave my family? Where do we go from here? As it turns out, plan B wasn't so bad. Proceeds from the sale topped a million dollars, which we now have as fresh powder for investment acquisitions and the forever home, which of course will be a big reno project of some sort. But the full story, the total financial picture from how much we put down, how much we put into the renovation, how much rent we collected over the years, how much taxable income we were able to defer through a cost segregation analysis, the final bottom line on the whole endeavor, all of that calls for a whole nother video, which I'll be making soon. Subscribe so you don't miss it.